this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. The German offensive to capture Stalingrad began in August 1942, using Frederick Paulus's 6th Army and elements of the 4th Panzer Army. The attack was supported by intense bombing that reduced much of the city to rubble. The battle quickly degenerated into house-to-house fighting as both sides fought for the city on the Volga. By mid-November, the Germans were on the brink of victory as the Soviet defenders clung to a final few slivers of land along the west bank of the river. Then, on the 19th of November, the Red Army launched Operation Uranus, targeting the weaker Romanian allies protecting the 6th Army's flank, and the Germans in Stalingrad were surrounded and cut off. Hitler was determined to hold the city, insisting that Paulus hold out and the 6th Army would be supported by air. With the airlifted disaster, in February 1943, without food or ammunition, some 91,000 starving Germans surrendered. In this episode of the podcast, I'm joined once more by Jonathan Trigg. John specialises in looking at aspects of the war from the German perspective. So, in episode 147, we looked at Operation Barbarossa. In episode 115, John and I discussed the end of the war. And in episode 102, we talked about D-Day. Well, John has a new book out, The Battle of Stalingrad Through German Eyes, The Death of the Sixth Army. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome back, John. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Um, Shall we start with uh, Case Blue? I I almost think that Stalingrad was was an accident. So, um, yeah, Case Blue, I guess that's our starting point. What what, what were its objectives? Uh, You're you're absolutely right by saying it was an accident. I mean, that, that encapsulates... Stalingrad for me, Barbarossa's failed, died in the in the snows in front of Moscow um, in the beginning of December forty one. You know, Soviet counteroffensive rolls back the almost destroys the German army in the east. Uh, I mean, really does come very very close to 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 the whole thing just disintegrating. And then I, mean, I think the best way to describe it is Hitler and all of the generals then sat down and go, bugger, what do we do now? There was no plan. There was no, oh, right. Um, so if we don't win the war with Barbarossa in 41, don't worry. We've got, we've got this excellent you know, secondary plan to do this, this and this. They all just sat there, scratched their heads and go, oh, dear, that didn't, that didn't work. Um, what now? German armed forces were geared to, to summer war. That was, that's always them. They, they, you know, until, until you know, the Ardennes and Battle of the Bulge um, uh, and so on, they, just, they never mounted it. A major offensive during winter. It just they just they weren't equipped or trained and, and you know for it at all. So the Soviets knew that the when the spring thaw was over um, in early 42, the Germans were going to come again. Uh, and they thought that they would come against Moscow. So they were prepared, majority of their forces there. They thought, you know, Army Group Center is, is the fulcrum of the German front in the east. They're going to advance and try and finish the job off. Why, why wouldn't they attack Moscow? Um, central government, you know, massive economic power, military power. And most of Germany's generals, most of Hitler's generals thought the same. Thought that was that makes perfect sense. If we're going to, if we're going to force a decision, and that was that was all it was going to, we need to force a decision to this war. Um, it was going to be a t- take Moscow. But of course, what they failed to understand was Hitler had perhaps a different view on 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 how to fight a war on what you're fighting a war for you know racial concerns were hugely important for him but the other one was was as economic power he felt that was a subject that he understood that his generals didn't because he, he definitely had an inferiority complex about his generals in particular you know these extremely well-educated intellectual staff trained officers uh, and so on whereas he'd been a corporal you know runner in the first world war and then a you know, a, a, a DOS house, uh, kind of resident in, in Vienna after the war. So, so he always felt it kind of inferior. But when it came to economics, he thought, I'm, I'm, I've, got, I've got one up on my, on my generals. To be, to be fair to him is he understood that it was Germany's lack 
of economic resources were always the Achilles heel um, of Germany throughout throughout the ages, um, and particularly in a in a you know in a global war, and and most of all the biggest lack was oil. You know Germany has no resource, no you know oil fields of its own. Um, within the Reich, they had a, a few wells in Austria and a few in Hungary, and then you know large fields around Plersti in Romania, and they, they were they were shipping a lot to Germany. But it was it was still in the scale of things, it was it was tiny. You know, the UK receiving 10 million tonnes uh, of oil a year from the States um, and so on, let alone from, from you know, other, other points in the Middle East and what have you. And, and there's, there's Nazi Germany getting one, two million tonnes of it's lucky from Romania um, and trying to run a global war on, on that sort of basis. And yes, they had synthetic oil plants, so turned brown coal into, um, into fuel, which was which was incredibly expensive. But again, it just the sheer volume just wasn't there. So Hitler very much thought, right, what we're going to do is we need to secure oil and shed loads of it. Um, and where is that? That's down in the south. That's in the C- Caucasus. So all around Grozny and Maykop, so in, in nowadays Chechnya um, uh, and so on. All, that's where it is. There is a Shangri-La of oil. It's it's it's. And, and if we get it, one, we deprive the Soviets of it, hurrah, uh, and two, we can then literally have a bath in it. And we can, you know, run every tank we want 24-7 and just burn as much fuel as absolutely fine. So this is what we're going to do. And then it was about, you know, so once the decision was made, it was about how they were going to, to plan this enormously complex and difficult operation because it really did mean instead of the, the, the three prongs of Barbarossa and a, and, a, and a front moving all at, at once, it was right. Other two, Army Group North and Centre, will basically stay in position. We're going to put everything down in Army Group South and it's going to advance about a thousand miles, which they'd failed to do in Barbarossa. How they thought that, oh, I know we didn't do it when, when we were at our strongest and now we've taken a bit of a kicking over the winter. We can definitely achieve it. They set about, to be honest, just repeating the same mistakes that they had done in in 41 with Barbarossa. So how does Stalingrad become a target? It wasn't mentioned as a specific objective in Hitler's directive for the for Case Blue. There was there was a vague reference to it in terms of they, what they need, what they understood was by, you know, if you if you look at them a, a map about what they were trying to do, you're going, that's that's potty. That doesn't make any sense. Um, it's, it's the, we're going to advance on one front, hundreds and hundreds of miles, and just we're going to be open to attack on our, on our flank, our left-hand northern flank, for, for hundreds upon hundreds of miles. Uh, and they said the way that we're going to, to stop that happening, that they described it as, as we're going to build a hard shoulder so that the mass of the German force would head down to the Caucasus, Caucasus and, and get the oil. And a secondary force, but still very large, would then literally go straight east and hit the, the Volga River. Uh, and of course, any look at, at the map says you're going to arrive somewhere in the Stalingrad area. And it would make sense to take Stalingrad and use that as your kind of anchor point and then stretch your, your soldiers across the, the kind of the river line to form this hard shoulder that then protects all the troops going down to Caucasus and getting the oil. But of course, what that meant is that you've got two wildly diverting objectives. Yet again, the, you know, the Achilles heel of the German armed forces is its inability to, to solve its logistics issues comes massively into play. It must have been a bit surreal because they're going, right, so what we'll do is this, this kind of secondary objective going towards the Volga. Literally, what we're going to do, we'll, we'll have this, we'll have the, the, the Sixth Army, which is the largest field force in the, in the, in the Wehrmacht at the time. And just just march in that direction. That's that's literally what we want you to do. Just keep on going, you know, across the steppe for hundreds and hundreds of miles until you'll probably hit the Volga around there, kind of Stalingrad-y way. Uh, when you do, stop um, and you know dig in, and, and then everything will be absolutely fine. And so they must have just gone. This is this is a bit weird, and they just kind of literally just marched off. It's like it's like the it's like the Ninth Legion. You know when when they when they, when they disappeared in 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 the, in the in the Highlands, it's like going these guys just must have just just gone marching, going where the hell are we going? Just literally, just, just in this heat haze 
they, you know, and, and uh, dying of thirst. And they're going, we're going to march 30 miles a day again, which is what, kind of what we did last year. And we have to keep on doing it. And we're just going to keep on until, until when? Uh, and, and, of course, they constantly kept on running out of fuel. So they had to stop, wait a couple of weeks until they got, you know, fuel brought up, then go again, then stop. And it was stop, 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 stop. They're fighting, you know, quite a few battles kind of along the way, losing a, a, a lot of guys. Um, actually, you know, several thousand men um, had, had gone before they got anywhere near. And then eventually they start to they start to arrive before Stalingrad, one of the weirdest designed cities um, in, in Europe. Um, and obviously European Russia at the time, because, um, of course, most cities, if you kind of look at them from, from an aerial perspective, they're kind of oval, roundy, ovally type shapes. That's, that's just the way that, that they work. And particularly those with, um, with rivers running, running through them. You know, it tends to be you'll either have a, a northern and a southern or an east or a west or whatever. Yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the way it's formed. Stalingrad, no, absolutely not. What we'll do is we'll have the eastern bank with literally hardly anything on it. So on the far bank, as, as the Germans would see it, we'll have a few suburbs, but nothing much at all. Everything's going to be on the western bank. And what we're going to do is just we're not going to build out into the steppe. We're just going to build along the river for miles and miles and miles. So it's like a, it's like a strip mall that just runs for, for you know 20 odd miles from north to south, but is, is about four miles wide. Um, and it's at its broadest. So, so it, it, it really is. It's a it's a it's a stick. And, and you know, the Germans are getting closer and closer. But again, every time they get close, run out of fuel, run out of fuel, stop again. And in the meantime, the drive towards the Caucasus is carrying on. And that's where everyone is focusing. So all Hitler's generals are focusing on the drive. That's that's, you know, the primary objective. That's where you want to go. Friedrich Paulus and the, and the Sixth Army, they're going to, they'll reach the river and then they'll do what we always do, take the city. The Russians will, you know, fight a bit um, and then they'll evacuate to the to the Eastern Bank and disappear and um, hey-ho, uh, it, it, it's all going to, it's all going to plan. Who was Paulus? You, you mentioned him there. He's, he's, he's got, you know, such a powerful unit. He had been in North Africa at one point who pops up overseas. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was, he was, he was a strange character in America. He was very highly thought of by a majority of the kind of very, very top senior German leadership, including Hitler, who thought this guy was a real, you know, he, he was a winner and knew what he was doing and, and so on. But but he hadn't held a command appointment bigger than battalion. Um, that had been his last big one. And, and since then, it's just been staff jobs. And he was, uh, you know, a, a real product of the German general staff system. So he understood staff work and how it operated, but but just to be honest, was was a bit lost when it came to commanding troops in the field. He had lots and lots of little idiosyncrasies. So he was called, you know, the the Lord um, and so on because he, he didn't like dirt. Um, he was obsessive about getting dirt under his fingernails. That really freaked him out. Um, so he used to wear gloves a lot. Um, he he insist on having a, a kind of a bath every day. Even on even on campaign in the field, and would change would change his shirts in particular regularly, um, you know, two three times a day. Felt yes, I felt that was very important. And, and he wasn't, you know, a, a Rommel um, and so on. Yeah, leading from the front, out with the troops. He was a maps general. Yeah, that's that's what he was, and that's how he that's how he ran his campaigns. And, and to put someone you know like that in charge of the the largest field force in the army. I, I don't think well, it wasn't a good decision because um, he just simply didn't have the experience to do it. And then, um, you know, the, the Sixth Army had been remodelled um, kind of over the winter. It had a host of new divisions brought into it. You know, it was this kind of new breed of army that the Germans were trying to do. So before they'd had infantry armies and, and panzer armies and Sixth Army was a bit of a hybrid, as, as with a lot of hybrids. It was a really rubbish decision because that you just what you, instead of solving the problems that the infantry or the armor had, so armor needed more infantry, um, infantry needed more mobility. Actually, what you did was you made both issues worse. You used to have panzers that would just race ahead of their infantry, um, get themselves in a bit of trouble, and then have to have to stop and wait for the infantry again, and then they'd run out of fuel so the infantry couldn't move uh, because they couldn't leave the panzers stra- stranded. So it, it was it was it was a, a poorly thought out experiment 
really in in military structure and they put a guy in charge of it who was 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 not suited to field command you know this guy would have made an absolutely great chief of staff not a problem at all um, but put him in charge of a, of a, of a field army um, that has to, to do what sixth army was tasked with doing you're you know you, you're, you're asking for trouble really did, did he expect to have to take stalingrad i mean what was his what, what was his plan or, or did he just think that they could bypass it somehow or i mean has they done elsewhere well this, this is the thing I mean, I, obviously doing the research I, i've never understood why he insisted on on attacking the place because you know why bother? I can't help but feel because it's got the word Stalin in the, the in the title. Everybody became obsessed with it, possibly more than they needed to. Yeah, it did over time. I think because there's always been this issue. Oh, it's like oh, the Germans got drawn into a into a, a street battle and they got no experience of, of of street warfare. And I'm like going, really? How many cities have they already taken? They say they taken dozens. They knew what they were doing in 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 that respect, and, and what they usually did. They bypass them. So they're going to be defended. They literally just go you know, north and south of it, bounce over the river, turn around, surround the place, uh, and the, the, the Soviets would go, um, but let's, let's, let's head off. And then the Germans would do what the, what the Germans did, which is level it. So, you know, aerial bombardment, boom, 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 shock and awe, hit them with loads and loads of firepower, and then, then they just go, right, do you know what? This is, this is rubbish, let's go, bang, and they all, they all skedaddle. And, and that had been the, the way that they'd taken city after city after city that the, that the Soviets had defended. The ones that they didn't defend, they'd obviously just, just take fairly easily. But that's, that's the way they did it. But when Paulus and the Sixth Army got near to Stalingrad, I think logistics was the key issue. He just didn't have the fuel to do what was sensible, which was to cut the place off. You know, big sweeping manoeuvres. They were, you know, that logistics issue forced them into doing something that they weren't prepared to do. And then Paulus's plan was, right, we'll reach the northern and southern ends of the city and then just attack kind of up and down the river and meet in the middle. Um, and we'll just roll, roll them up. Um, and it was a poorly thought through plan that they then insisted on continuing with for the best part of August and September 1942. Uh, and it just turned into a meat grinder an absolute meat grinder and the, the soviets at first weren't that bothered themselves about defending it well is, is there anything strategic about stalingrad particularly it was more it was more about the volga river itself because the, the issue for them was that the, the volga was the, the artery through which all of their grain from the south would you know everything would flow from the south all the resources would then flow up to you know to to, to uh, moscow um, and so on into the into the Russian heartland, and and of course there's big big tank factories there and all that type of thing. But to be honest, they've got you know they've got industry beyond the Urals, so so they they they, they didn't need it in that way. Just as the Germans hadn't designated it as a as a primary objective, you know it's 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 that old phrase facts on the ground. You know the Soviets hadn't uh, hadn't designated it as a primary uh, defensive position either. And then as the battle kind of progressed and ramped up i mean it was it was like a high stakes poker game that they 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 start to ramp up against each other so all of a sudden you've got stalin saying hang on a sec there's something happening here right we'll 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 start you know blaring out huge announcements that the heroic defenders of stalingrad there is no land beyond the volga defend it last man last you know last bullet all that type of stuff and of course hitler and the Nazi propaganda machine hear that perk up, and then all of a sudden it's like going, "Oh yes, Stalin City. Yeah, he's 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 all he's all getting uppity about it. So we need to take it. So so then he's constantly you know badgering powers, going, "When are you gonna? When are you gonna take the city? When are you? Gonna take, you know, we need to take it. So so and and, and he goes to uh, give his annual speech to Party Faithful at the Burgerbrow Keller, um, uh, and he's like going, "Oh, there's this city on the Volga. Oh, I think it's called Stalingrad. Oh, who cares? We're, we're, we're going to take it. It's, it's all fantastic. And so, so they just kept on from, from this place that no one really bothered that much about at the beginning. Took on, took on, you know, it took on a life of its own. You know, the Soviets realised the Germans were just, you know, battering. That's all they were doing. There's no, no innovation, you know, no real, uh, you know, plan or whatever. It was just thump, 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 which the, the Germans were not structured equipped or, or trained to do and and the soviets realized that they could just drip feed in enough blood to to keep 
a foothold in the city and keep the Germans, you know, wearing themselves against it. And then if they did lose it, well, they, they lost it, but they could talk about heroic defence. Everything's great. It wouldn't really matter. And it went on like that for, for you know, into October. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the Germans were just, it, it literally measured in yards. And it's like, going, oh, yes, only been 14 days. And we've already taken that building. Suddenly you get these, you know, the names of the Red October factory and, you know, and so on. And the Lazo Chemical Works and, and, and so on. The Barricardi factory, all these things that they take on a life of their own. You know, the grain elevator um, in the south, and you know, the Mameyev Kurgan in the centre of the city. And all of a sudden, it's 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 they are huge, huge bodies of troops are expending massive amounts of ammunition on the German side to literally take a building that's that's two hundred meters by five hundred meters or whatever, losing huge amounts of casualties. And of course, for them, that's a real issue. The Soviets, I mean, you know, the Soviets have, have never really given an accurate, or they never did, obviously, but an accurate picture of their casualties. But it, lit, literally, the plan was that they were going to, you know, pour blood and meat into into the German tank tracks to to to, to stop them. I mean, that was it was to use flesh to to clog up the German war machine, and and it's horrific. But it's also brilliant, and and it really does. It just it just wears them down. The Germans driving, and they they just haven't got the reinforcements because, of course, at the same time, their main body of the offensive is down in the Caucasus. Yeah, all of a sudden they're leaving Europe. They're in Asia now. They've got Bactrian camels, you know, humping forward ammunition, and they're looking at they're looking at the, at the you know um, at the Caucasus Mountains and Mount Elbrus and all this type of thing, and they go, oh my god, we are this is. This is weird. You know, that was the objective of Bloom. And yet over time, um, you know, over those kind of you know, late August, September, October, the, the emphasis shifts for both the Soviets and the Germans to Stalingrad, to a place that, that no one looked at before. And, and the real objective of the operation, which was to get that oil, suddenly becomes almost irrelevant. I mean, in a way, it suited, it suited Hitler because... He hadn't, the, 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 just as with Barbarossa, Army Group South was not resourced to do what he wanted it to do. Um, it just simply didn't have the mass um, and they were just running out of troops. So, you know, what the start of the offensive would be, you know, three armies going forward into the Caucasus. Suddenly it's the best part of two and then it gets down to one and then it's three core, then it's, a call, then it's a you know a couple of it, and by the end they're launching attacks with 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 battalions, and they're still hundreds of miles from where they wanted to be, and and he looks at you going, how did they think, even if they reach these oil fields, and they did reach one in Makop, but how do they think they're going to exploit it? Because you don't just turn up and go, oh there you go, SO petrol station, that's handy, just keep on pouring it, boys, we're we're, we're perfectly fine. You've got you've got you know huge infrastructure of oil drilling and refining and then you've got to transport it and all this type of thing and and they're literally looking around going oh well there's eight of us how's that going to work um and, and, it, and it was it's just they, they they ran out of steam ran out of machines ran out of men um and ran out of ideas really what's the Luftwaffe doing over stalingrad because presumably they could be interdicting the russians as they're coming in uh, did the Luftwaffe still have air superiority at this point <laughs> they they did but the, but the but the issue with the Luftwaffe always was that they could uh, finance one major po- major point of effort, uh, and they were, they were being asked to do about fourteen at the same time, and they simply didn't have the mass. So the Luftwaffe is there over Stalingrad. You know they they carried out a, a huge initial raid in August, um, and they were you know trying to to do the best they could, but they were still then being told you've got to, you, you, your main effort has got to be down in the Caucasus. So you're on, you know, forward grass airstrips in the middle of the in the middle of the steppe, hundreds of miles away from absolutely everyone, um, and you, you've still got to be, be, you know, defeating the, the Soviets over that. And oh, by the way, we need to also keep them away from Army Group Centre and Army Group North, and oh, and the, and the Mediterranean theatre is suddenly geeing up now because, of course, at that time we're talking we're getting towards El Alamein. So Rommel is screaming for more. Air Park, because the de- you know our desert air force is is absolutely giving him a bit of a kicking. Luftwaffe is being told you've got to send more 
more resources down to the Mediterranean, down to Africa. And they're going, geez, where's, where's it going to come from? You can just you know, see it in the in the figures. So the bombing raids and what they're able to do, it just goes down and down and down and, and quite rapidly. So the, the, the Soviets, who are, who are pretty much being left alone on the Eastern Bank, yeah, they, they, they can mass artillery, shoot across the river at the Germans and, and be relatively safe. And at the same time, just keep on feeding men and supplies into the city. And yes, they'll, they'll stukas or blow a few of the boats up and all that type of thing. Oh, well, never mind. I mean, you know, we're talking about a, a, a Red Army war machine that would, you know, form a, form a new division in a fortnight, you know, five, 6,000 men up to 10,000 men. They'd be, they'd be formed in that time and they'd literally be semi-equipped. So they say, right, half the guys can have a weapon. Most of the rifles won't have stocks. For instance, because you know, it takes time to put a stock on a rifle. You don't need it. You know, don't be silly. It's perfectly fine. Uh, we'll give you a handful of rounds and, and no maps. Just march that way um, and just appear. And then it wasn't a case of, okay, you're you've fought really hard for the last kind of week, so you've pulled out the line for rest. It's literally you no. Know, you stay in the line until you, until you've either won or you're dead. And when the unit when the unit you know is burnt out completely, and it's disintegrated. They just form another one. Feed that in. Is this town? Of- I f- not only didn't write it down, but the, the Soviets start introducing that SMG, don't they? The, um, yeah, the, the PPSH-41, yeah. Push, yeah, push the, the, the classic-looking thing with a uh, drum, drum magazine. magazine. I mean, fantastic. Are they there in number? I mean, is that a revolutionary thing? Because presumably you could just give those out to troops with not a lot of training and just send them forward and just say fire, just spray. Just spray. And, and you, you're absolutely right. That's what they did in the course. You know, in that kind of environment... Uh, street fighting, usually fighting very close. So you know you're out on the step. You, you want you want an accurate rifle that can shoot out to 300 meters. So your German soldier with his with his Mauser 98 is going. This is a bit of a winner. Bolt action, bang! Oh, there's another one. Yeah, bang! It's like potting rabbits. But of course, all of a sudden he's in a city where the you know the Soviets are 20 meters away, if not closer. And his bolt action rifle now that can accurately hit something at 300 meters is actually a bit of an impediment. Because the guy, the guys he's fighting, have got a submachine gun, you know, with a drum magazine, and they're just spraying him. Now his squad leader has the old classic Schmeiser, although of course they weren't Schmeiser's MP, MP40s. Um, so he has one of those, but he's the only one that has it. So everyone else has got a rifle, and they're up against a, a you know, a, a, a Soviet squad, same number, where one of them might have a rifle, the rest have got some machine guns. The Soviets really did improvise and and innovate where the Germans didn't. So, yes, they just did not care about casualties. Uh, And they had their infamous blocking detachments. So, you know, made up of uh, squads of officers and and, and, soldiers who were particularly, you know, loyal to the party and what have you, who would form up behind an attack. Soviets go charging forward. And if they failed and then tried to retreat, they get shot by their own side. Zukov famously said it takes it takes a very brave man to be a coward in the Red Army. I, th- I think he got it spot on, but at the same time they did improvise. So you know they set up street fighting academies in the city, and and they trained their squads actually in the city, almost under German fire. They absolutely adapted what they were going to do for the environment they were in. So they said, right, we'll have, you know, we'll have a, um, an, an assault detachment, and they they will take building X. So you know that that that, that building that they'll take it, but they're going to be followed up by another detachment that as soon as they've got that building, they're in and then they're, they're equipped differently because they, they set up for defence because they know German uh, um, you know, military dogma is counterattack. So always, always counterattack, counterattack. So they know Germans thrown out of the building, they're going to counterattack. So, so new fresh guys come in who then set up mines, you know, they've got wire, uh, they've got more machine guns and et cetera, et cetera. So, so when the Germans counterattack, the Russians are, are waiting for them. Um, and the Germans are going, oh, my God, I can't believe this. You know, we thought we were, you know, that, that the best time to throw someone out of buildings when you just lost it, you know, and they're just sitting there because they're sweating and they're absolutely knackered and they've taken on casualties. Well, all of a sudden they've got fresh troops and they also have flanking detachments who will then come out and cut off the Germans who are trying to, to counter it. I mean, they, they really did. And then the use of snipers. Snipers, for instance, you know, in a modern British army, you would have, you know, for instance, you, you might have a sniper detachment in a battalion, maybe a platoon. The Soviets were like going, we don't want we don't want a few hundred. We want thousands, thousands and thousands. We don't need to train them to to hit a target at, at five kilometers um, and so on on a windy day. We just need them to have some basic sniper training. We'll use specially tooled normal rifles. 
So during the, the process of you know, the Moise and Nagant rifles, they'd literally say, all oh, right, OK, this one is going on the production line. We'll just engineer it to be to be you know, a higher standard. But, it, but it's, it's, you know, but not not go over the top and then fit it with a scope. And there you go, sniper rifle. And, and they're handed out in their in their tens of thousands. So the Soviets don't have 20, 50, 100 snipers. They've got hundreds. And, and they start to, again, innovate with them. So Vasily Zaitsev's you know, idea of the sixes. So we have three teams of two. So three shooters, three spotters. They'll be in points and completely dominate um, an, a, an area. None of that area is not covered by a sniper team. So anything that's in it is gone. And we will we'll use them in an innovative way. So we'll go, ah, oh, no, for instance, what we know is all our food, you know, on the Soviet side, now the, you know, the Americans are, are pouring Lend-Lease, uh, you know, stuff in. They, they get dried rations and all that type of thing. And that's what they're eating, all packaged. So, but of course, the Germans don't have that. Oh, absolutely not. Germans like the French, you know, they, they have they have wonderful field kitchens that produce a beautiful meal of bratwurst and vegetables and, uh, and so on. It's all hot and lovely. And it's all produced in the rear. And then platoons will, companies will send their, send a couple of guys back with a container on the back, all filled up. And then they'll come back with their one hot meal a day that all the guys been so looking forward to, can't wait, until, hey, presto, the snipers start drilling them. Even if they don't kill them, they dive to the floor. Half this hot food is shot up over their neck and on the ground, and then they're under fire. So by the time they get there, it's freezing cold. There's hardly any of it left. You know, if they're trying to get to, the, to, to, to water points, we'll set up snipers by water points. So, you know, they can't, they can't even get fresh water in the, uh, in, in the heat. And all what we'll do is, is the Germans, again, don't use radios. They use landlines. So we'll cut the landline and then just wait. And at some point, Fritz will turn up, following down the line to find where the brake is to bend it, bang, shoot him and wait for his mate to turn up. Because then they go, oh, it's not working. What's happened to Fritz? Go, Hans, you go out and see where Fritz is. You know, well, Fritz is now dead and Hans follows him very quickly. And, and all of this starts to kind of come together and, and wears away the, the very innards of the, of the Sixth Army. You know, this army that hadn't been that hadn't gone through Barbarossa as a as a formed unit in the state that it was. You know, most as I said lots and lots of the divisions were new, so all the veteran divisions have been well. A lot of the veteran divisions have been uh, transferred out. They got a lot of new divisions in, so, and they hadn't operated as an army. Um, you know, for for very long at all before this, and and so they're just getting used to the you know each other and how it all worked, and and they're just being worn away. As soon as they get any ammunition, it's fired. I mean, the ammunition expenditure is just beyond belief. It is very much. We can just, we'll just, you know, we'll blast everything. We'll blast. And then, you know, they start, for instance, they start going, right, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll have the panzers lead. So they'll charge down the streets and the infantry will follow, so the infantry will be protected. But, of course, a panzer can't go down a street in Stalingrad because it's an absolute mess. Um, it's huge craters and there's massive piles of rubble and, you know, the tracks are, the tracks are being lost. So, so, you know, they're being channeled into, into where the Soviets want them. Mines, anti-tank guns, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails down on them from above. And all that. So, of course, then they go, oh, that didn't work. So what we'll do is we'll send the infantry forward first and, and hold the tanks back. And the tanks will then provide fire support. Of course, the infantry are going forward going, make this idea. You know, get, get Panzer Boy to lead on this. He's got covered in steel. I'm literally, I'm wearing a, a 1942 blooming field blouse. You know, that's not, that's not going to, that's not going to repel a flamethrower. They start to then take casualties and they just go to ground and their officers and NCOs trying to get them up and they're going, oh, I don't, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't think so. Get the tanks forward and, and we'll think about it. But so, so, you know, they try things and then they have this, this view, they, they bring in their, well, they call them pioneer battalions. It was pioneers for British military in the war, basically with someone with a shovel. And I don't mean to denigrate pioneers, uh, of course, but it was it was a shovel and they used to dig holes. Pioneers in the in the German army were assault engineers, combat engineers, um, and they are specially trained uh, and they're highly motivated uh, and they're specialist troops and they've got you know a, a range of equipment that, that suits them for, uh, for for street fighting. But it's the sheer numbers. So for every battalion. Of, of combat pioneers that the Germans are putting forward, that the Soviets are putting in a division. No matter how good these guys are, they're just they're just getting overwhelmed with just sheer numbers. And Paulus's answer constantly is just more firepower, more of the same. I've got no, I've got no other ideas. We're just going to grind. He was literally 
ripping the heart out of his own army in this mistaken belief that, that, that you'd hit this nirvana of you suddenly take all the city and hey presto what the wall would end you know the, the soviets would just give up um uh, and so on you know it's just 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 not going to happen were they prepared for another winter winter's closing in remarkably they were again when, when, I, when I read about Stalingrad a lot before I, I did think oh there's pictures of them you know they've got no winter uniforms again you know and all this type of stuff. you go oh the bloody hell you know they're all wearing ladies scarves around their necks and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but no so so they had actually prepared for another winter because they knew they were going to unlike Barbarossa where they thought no we're not going to because it's going to be over before winter, so we're not going to have to do it. They thought, no, it's not going to be over, so we need to be prepared. So, so they'd um, you know, ordered thousands of, of winter uniforms, reversible um, you know, winter uniforms, and they were all stalled behind the lines. They built massive numbers of dugouts, um, because, of course, the, the army wasn't just in the city itself. It was out on a step going out uh, towards the, 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 the River Don, they, they built huge numbers of, of shelters that were purpose built, you know, and covered from artillery fire and stoves in and, you know, actually pretty, pretty comfortable. They got you know, special greases in for weaponry and so on. But of course, that was all in their bases, secure logistics bases, actually quite a hell of a way from Stalingrad because no one ever thought that the, the Soviets would counterattack. The, the Slavic untermension, they can't possibly, you know, we do things like that and not them. So we'll, we'll leave it in all of our uh, main bases until, it, until it's needed in the winter. And so, and so in the meantime, it's not needed because uh, it's, still, it's still quite, quite warm. You know, even October, along comes someone with a, with a different idea, which is obviously Georgi Zhukov. Is that that's Uranus, Operation Uranus? Yes. And, and Stalin's idea was, oh, lovely counterattack, like that idea. But it was, it was fairly limited, caused more attrition and surprise. And didn't really think in, in kind of large terms, whereas Zhukov thought, and, and, and it came from his understanding that the Germans had put themselves in a really tricky position, in that the, the case blue itself was predicated on the fact is they just didn't have enough Germans. They'd lost so many in Barbarossa, in particular during the winter, that they just didn't have the numbers. So what they relied on was, you know, they did a tour of the of their allied capitals and they said, no, you know, you gave us about a division before. Well, what we really need is a lot more. And, and the allies had responded. So, so the Italians gave the Eighth Army, uh, which is one of their largest field formations, the Hungarians, their second army. Um, and the Romanians, even also Romanians, too. It was the, it was the third and fourth. I hadn't realised there was quite so many uh, non-Germans in the up there. I mean, Rundstedt, who commanded Army Group South to start with, he, he described it as a League of Nations army. He was uh, uh, quite dismissively. I mean, this was always a, one of the major problems with the Nazis was, was they didn't play well with other children. You know, the Allied Grand Alliance is, is, a, is a lesson in how to have coalition warfare, whereas the Nazis, you know, were, were the other end of the spectrum. They relied on so much of that, that hard shoulder, um, you know, like to be protected by Allied forces. So the, the German Sixth Army is fighting in Stalingrad. To its south is, is the Romanian Fourth Army. To its kind of northeast, it, not northwest, sorry, is, is the third Romanian army. Then you've got the Italians, then you've got the, the Hungarians. Yeah, they're stretching away. They've got ridiculously long frontages um, that they simply don't have the men or, or weapons to cover. And they're, they're, they're not equipped for it. I mean, they've barely got an anti -tank, modern anti-tank gun between them. In the main, they are not well trained. You know, their equipment, if what equipment they've got is a heck of a lot, was obsolete. You know, they've got barely any armor. You know, they're just sitting there. Uh, and the belief was, well, as long as they're there, they're doing something useful. We'd have to worry about it. we've got a, you know, we've got a Panzer Corps behind them, which so if the if the Soviets do attack, then we've got a Panzer Corps which will push them back. But of course, you know, the, the Panzer Corps that they were relying on. Just, it didn't have the power. Didn't have the power. I mean, I had one German tank division, which is a fairly new one, the 22nd, that uh, uh, performed fairly poorly up until that point. Um, and then the Romanian 1st Panzer Division with a load of old Czech and French tanks. So, I mean, and, and that was it's nothing like a you know, proper frontline German Panzer Corps. 
So when Uranus hits, do they do they just fold? I mean, the, the the narrative always is, oh, they just fold. They were, you know, they were not German troops. They were not interested in that. And that is, and I, to be honest, I I always thought that was the case. I thought, you know, pictures I had in my mind was, you know, loads of T thirty fours and white clad Soviet infantry charging through the snow, and Romanians, Italians, and Hungarians, going, oh, throwing up their hands as soon as they saw their first Russian and you know running away. And and that just is not true. Yes, some um, of them folded pretty quickly, but very large numbers, and particularly Romanians, fought very very hard. The, the battle was kind of in the you know, in the balance um, for quite some time, and there was just no reaction. There was disbelief on the German side that the Soviets could actually be doing something significant. It's thought you know that they're, they're they're not they're not capable. Of, of mounting a large, uh, despite, despite what they suffered back in December. So, so you know, they just literally, powerless, just sat on his hands and said, oh, no, nothing to do with us, nothing to see here. You know, let's carry on taking a, taking a block of shops in, in Stalingrad, whilst, whilst at the same time his, 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 his northern flank is being immolated. The, the Soviets just pour more force in. The Romanians are immobile and hardly got any vehicles. Once the Soviets are through, then they're dead. Um, you know, they, they, there's nothing they can do. And they literally just disintegrate. But after putting up a stiff fight, and they did so in this, not as much in the South, because the Fourth Army um, had been wrecked in the Battle for Odessa uh, back in 41, taking huge casualties um, and was a shadow of its former self. And But even they, they, they really did put up a fight. But once the Soviets were through them, they, they couldn't react. You know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't redeploy to get in front of the Soviets again. They were literally cut off and wandering across the, the snow-covered steps, going, what the hell What the hell do we do now? And, and the Germans just didn't react quickly enough. And, and all of a sudden, the Panzer Corps, Ferdinand, Ferdinand Heim's Panzer Corps, gets, right, you've got a, you've got a counterattack here. You're, you're our last chance. And, of course, everything happens. So he's got the Romanian Panzer Division, they actually done, they'd done fairly well, but of course they'd suffered very badly. Their equipment was very obsolete. They weren't anything like a German Panzer Division in terms of strength. There was very little coordination. Their communications broke down between the two divisions pretty much straight away. And as for the Germans, they had so little fuel that, that, that what they'd done before the weather is that they dug these ta- dug the Panzers into you know, earth kind of dugouts and then surrounded them with straw to protect them. And of course, that was all lovely and cosy. And it's lovely and cosy for mice. When I, when, I, when I read about this, I was like going, that's just crazy. That is crazy. But yeah, the, the mice were just in there. And of course, because they were so short on fuel, what would normally happen is that every day the Panzer crew would get in their Panzer and they take it out and they run the engine and, you know, and then they do maintenance and so on. But they couldn't do that because they didn't have the fuel. So they just left them for, for weeks. And of course, the mice had just overrun these things and chewed through the electric cables. So they press the starter buttons and nothing happens. Literally, about half, you know, about half the panzers, they can't even start. And then all of the, uh, the roads are covered in ice and snow so that they have proper kind of snow tracks for them. Great. We've got, where are they? Uh, and they can't find them. They, they were lost somewhere uh, back, in the, back in the midst of time. You know, the, the panzers are then sliding off the tracks into ditches and, oh, my, it's, it's an utter disaster. So by the time they get into the fight, there's literally a... a, a tiny amount of them and the most they can do is give the soviets a bit of a a bit of a knock and then retreat themselves so this 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 amazing counterattack of a, of a strong german panzer corps just disappeared by the time it hit it was it was you know had, had the power of a of a ball of steam there's a hundred thousand men encircled in stalingrad isn't it was the discussions on whether you take a hundred thousand men and punch out which presumably that's got quite a punch to punch out or did they just think, well, there must be something out there. Let's relieve them. The Soviets at first, when they, when they, when their pincers came together at Kalach on the on the on the Don, you know, they, they'd never they'd never mounted an operation like that before, and it, it succeeded. They were they were actually quite taken aback. And Zhukov was kind of telling Stalin, and he was hedging his bets because he didn't want to disappoint the boss. He said, "I think I think we've I think we might have encircled eighty thousand Germans." And of course, Stalin was going, 80,000, that's amazing, that's incredible. And then actually, it was over 200,000. And there was, you know, the whole 6th Army, bar a, a few troops that uh, managed to escape, a lot of the 4th Panzer Army, loads of, of Croats, 
there were Slovaks, there were Romanians who hadn't managed to, to escape. My picture before of the way that they decided with the airlift was uh, all the Germans, you know, senior officers said, right, we need to punch out. We need to break out as when the, when the and circle is at its, its weakest. So straight away, get out now um, and then, you know, redeploy, sort ourselves out and, and come back stronger. And then Hitler had made a, 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 one of his immensely stupid decisions and said, no, no, we're going to sit, stay where you are, we're going to respond by air. But the picture is far more nuanced than that. So, so German command, senior commanders were split. So a lot of the, the generals inside Stalingrad said, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to go. That means we're going to lose, we're going to lose, you know, leave a lot of our heavy equipment. We might even leave some of the wounded, uh, but we have got to get out now. Um, it's, it's our kind of only chance. But Paulus wasn't giving a lead. So it's his army. And he was literally kind of turning around to the generals going, well, what do you think? And then I go, well, what do you think? Because, you know, you are our commander. And he said, well, you know, I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a consensus view, um, which is not what an army commander um, should be doing. Back in German headquarters, Hitler was, was undecided himself. He wanted to know, is it possible for the airlift to happen? You know, Goering famously, you know, yes, my Fuhrer, you know, of course we can, you know, we can definitely put an airlift and keep it together. And of course, you know, load of, load of other generals, chief of staff, Zeitzler, was going, you're mad. There's no way we can do that. He's like, do you even know how, mu how much stuff they're going to need? And Goering goes, uh, no. And, and, and Hitler says, well, if, you know, Goering's my de uh, deputy, and if he says he can do it, then it's out of my hands. I can't, I can't say he's a liar. Um, and, and then they try to work out, well, they didn't even try to work out. Then literally they were just guessing as to, as to how much stuff, what tonnage was needed per day. I mean, no one at any time, as, as far as I can you know, ascertain, sat down and worked out what Sixth Army needed to survive. Um, so this figure, this, this, this magical figure of 300 tonnes a day. Doesn't sound like a lot to me. <laughs> no, no, exactly. And, and it really was. It was just guesswork. They're kind of going, yeah, that probably sounds about right. Fuel and ammunition's heavy. <laughs> that, that, that's it. And, and again, you know, I mean, the airlift was an unmitigated disaster from, from start to finish. It really was. But that's the thing. Fuel and ammo are bulky, heavy items. And an army uses an absolute pile of it all the time. So, so let alone food. Food was not important at that stage because the army has quite a lot of resources. Needed fuel and ammunition more than anything else. The Luftwaffe's transport arm, after the losses at Crete in particular back in 41, was just nowhere capable of, of mounting the sort of massive, coordinated, effective airlift that was going to be needed um, to support that. And, and I think, I think they, they hit the 300-ton a day figure about a dozen times in total um, during the entire siege because it was winter. They didn't factor in the weather. So loads of days were, 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 were snowed out. Transport aircraft they had, I mean, literally could take a few tons, if that. And it took ages to, to load and unload them. Soviet fighters were everywhere by then. The, 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 you know, the Luftwaffe was having real problems protecting its own transport aircraft and providing any sort of, um, of air cover. There was no organisation. And what always amazed me was that, was that Paulus and his chief of staff, Schmidt, never, ever once went to see what was going on with the airlift. The, the lifeline for their army, um, they never once bothered to, to, to go and see it for themselves because they were going, well, that's a Luftwaffe responsibility. And, and of course, the Soviets just, just, just feasted, uh, kept on pushing west. And, and, and it just meant that the airlift, you know, field, airfield after airfield kept on getting taken. So the airlift kept on getting you know, further and further away. It was, just, it was an absolute spiral. Uh, of disaster. So many of the, the personal stories that you read is is from guys who did get out. What amazed me is they were taking out in, in, in and out field posts. Also taking out field posts as well. I was, why wouldn't you? But it, it was like, wow, of all the things you, you're filling up with, tons and tons of, of letters. It, 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 was, it was how they decided who would, who would get out as well. How, how they decided what they'd bring in. There was no real organisation for a very, very long time. You know, not the kind of the depth of organisation that you'd require. The guys himself, like Fritz Moritz, was, was uh, the kind of chief Luftwaffe guy, Fritz Morzink, who was doing it. Now, he was very good, but he just didn't have a big staff. And on the Stalingrad side, 
it was literally just a few officers, you know, and small staffs at the at the at the, at the airports at Gumrak and so on, literally dealing dealing with this flow that was life and death for them all. Um, it just didn't seem to be a real priority. Um, and at the same time, you know, they're fighting, and and you know, it gets gets to the point where that issue about ammunition, so so hardly any fuel coming in, and so it means all of a sudden they can't manoeuvre. Um, so they've still got the best part of two hundred Panzers in the in the pocket, but the things can't move. You know, they can't move their artillery because they can't move the prime you know, prime movers don't have fuel. And artillery, when it when it can fire, you got to ask God because you're allowed to fire one round. Um, and, and it gets to the point where. You know, even the soldiers were told, unless you're directly under attack, don't shoot because we don't have the bullets. So, so the, the Red Army guys are wandering around their trenches all standing up perfectly fine because they know the Germans can't fire them because they, they haven't got the bullets. This whole thing about food was the killer for the, for the Sixth Army needs reviewing on it because it did become a huge issue, obviously, once, they, once they'd eaten every horse. They, they could get their hands on and they have tens of thousands of the things by that stage by the time they started to starve um, and they, they were they're gone anyway because they couldn't fire um they didn't have the ammunition they couldn't move because they didn't have the fuel um so really for food was a bit of a it was not the killer because by then as an army they shot their bolt by that point i presume they just can't there's no way they could even break out anyway they're, they're not going anywhere you know manstein launched his counter offensive uh, winter storm Win- winter gewitter um, to try and break in but again he had no fresh troops so he was doing it with you know the few men that he had he needed powerless to break out he wasn't strong enough to get to the city he needed and of course powerless just uh, uh, did exactly what he did before which was sat on his hands an abrogation of responsibility and that, that that's what i find in a in a in an army that absolutely prided itself its entire dogma was individual soldiers at all levels make decisions um, that's what they are trained to do it's absolutely part of our um, military way of life you know making a decision whatever it is is better than making no decision that was you know the, the entire basis for german command structure and yet here you have an army commander who is just avoiding that exact thing not making any decision he's not touring around his troops you know he's not going and seeing what's like in the front line he literally sits in his headquarters I mean, throughout the battle, he'd stayed far out in the step, and it was only, you know, he was told when they got when they were first encircled, you've got to get close to the city because he was he was like thirty miles away. He stayed in his dugout throughout the entire time, um, and did not go out and see what was going on you know, through his own eyes. Um, he just kind of let it happen. He was he was completely passive. You know, if you look at the whole German senior command structure for for Army Group South, all of them were. Uh, to be honest, you know, Vix is the we brought in as a because they, they created two army groups. Vice the army group commander, he doesn't even figure very highly rated, a you know, successful commander. But he's like, what, what are you doing? What, what do you? How do you fill your days? Because you're not, you're not, you're not making any any you know important decisions about what's happening in this battle that, that, that could be a turning point in the war in the east. It seems to just disappear between Hitler and Palace. It becomes this 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 thing between the two of them, um, where Paulus literally will not make any decision without Hitler's explicit say so. It makes you wonder how he thought he was going to win. I mean, did the men in the field think they were just going to fight to the last man? Did they think? I mean, the men in the field had no idea what what was happening, other than we haven't got any food and ammunition. But presumably, the Russians offered surrender at some point. You know, they did. They did. I mean, what they. You know, guys are, are, uh, desert or they capture them and then they get them to, you know, all of a sudden they'd be, you know, on a megaphone going, oh, you know, it's it's, it's hands here. And I, I came over to, the, to our Soviet friends and, oh, they're so lovely. I've, I've eaten more than I can possibly say. And why don't you all just lay down your weapons? It's, it's you know, you're just ordinary German soldiers just like me. Um, and the Soviets, they're just like us, you know, shoot the Nazis, shoot the Nazi officers and come over. Um, and so none of them believe that. They all believed, almost to a one, that, that Hitler wasn't going to leave them in the lurch. You read their letters, which, which as you already said, they amazingly they, they used to take out um, in, in, in the aircraft on the, on the, on the airlift. And, and is, they just go, oh, yeah, I know. Fuhrer's not going to leave us in the lurch. He is going to come and get us. The, the commanders 
the army level in you know in, in particular in the division knew that wasn't true after Manstein's counteroffensive failed they knew they were on their own um, but the soldiers just didn't the soldiers thought no Hitler will not will not leave us here to to starve and die he will he'll come out with something he'll pull something out of the bag and of course unbeknown to them by then Hitler is is kind of just saying to his generals right you mustn't surrender because every day that you tie down huge Soviet forces gives us a breathing space. He'd written them off, but they didn't They didn't know that. They absolutely believed in him. Amazing loyalty, isn't it? Yeah, a blind loyalty, absolutely blind loyalty in this, you know, in this figure um, and in their own command structure. It's like they, they, couldn't, they couldn't fathom that the German army was going to fail against Slavic Untermensch. Intellectually, they couldn't process that thought. It just, you know, it, it, it just couldn't happen. You know, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's kind of heartbreaking because you, you, know, you, when you read their Feldpost letters, you know that that it's it's an, it's an illusion. Yeah, and, and they're either going to die in the fighting, or or they're going to go into a gulag, which and probably have no chance coming out. You know, but they they're almost pathetic in their kind of belief in it'll be all right. Is there a mass surrender? Does pa- or, or, or does it all kind of just fizzle out and there's sort of a surrender because Paulus is surrendered, but what is he surrendering? <laughs> it, it, it is, it, so, so even till the end, so right at the end, he was he put his headquarters in the, the Univermag kind of department store in the cellars there. And he just, he'd been invisible for, for days. Um, and he was, was out of contact with most of his senior commands. The, the, the city itself had then been broken into two parts. So there was a northern pocket and Paris was in the southern pocket. As the commander, um, it was his kind of responsibility. I mean, he asked Hitler repeatedly for permission to, recept, to, to surrender. Hitler refused. Um, and then Hitler tried the old tactic of promoting him to field marshal. No German field marshal had ever surrendered. If worse comes to worse, they, they, they committed suicide. Paris knew exactly what what... Hitler was kind of offering him and he was like going oh I'm a I'm a you know I'm a Catholic and suicide is a sin so I'm not going to do that oh no absolutely not but what he also refused to do was surrender his army um and and yet again gave them no leadership and then the Soviets turn up at his place and um and they say oh we'll get a we'll get a car to take you to our headquarters and you know him and him and Schmidt get in there and get taken over uh, and and they kind of surrender themselves but but Paulus just refuses to surrender the army and said it's down to them. So, so the northern pocket actually carries on for a day or so until they're just, you know, they ground to bits. And then, and then it really did. It was, you know, you use exactly right. It's a, it a real anticlimax. It fizzled out. Survivors would say all of a sudden, kind of looked out from our, you know, shelter, and there's just Soviet soldiers just wandering around, and they're not firing anymore. And because we just kind of said that's it. It's it's all. It's all done. Yeah, all of a sudden, there's no artillery coming down on us. We're not getting fired at. So they just kind of walk out of their shelters, hands up, um, and start to, to, to shuffle. And, and thousands of wounded are left in the snow. And, and you know, they all die. They freeze to death. And the, the Soviets count it all up. And they've got, oh, my God, we've got 91,000 prisoners here. These poor guys, a lot, of, a lot of them were walking wounded. You know, most haven't eaten in, in ages and so on. Physically, they're in a terrible state. And they just got marched out into snow and then had to march all over Soviet Union to various gulags where they just dropped like flies, mainly from typhus, cholera. So by end of Jan, 43. So within three to four months, the majority were dead. And in the end, when, when they were finally released in the, in the 50s, about 5,000 got back. Um, and, and again, you know, Paulus, of course, was... He'd been taken prisoner and he was he went to you know a special camp for, for general officers and was actually quite well looked after. And then at the end of the war, I mean, it was, it was his kind of final betrayal is that he was he did a press conference and he was asked by a journalist about the fate of his men who'd gone into captivity with him. And he said, oh, I can assure the wives and mothers that they're, that they're all perfectly fine. There's no way that he didn't know that the vast majority were dead. Um, and there were very, very few left. It's the, the mark of the man. He was a he was a very strange character. He really does stand out among senior German 
officers. They produce an awful lot of, of very, very good commanders and aggression tended to be one of the dominant characteristics of the senior German officer corps uh, and, and decisiveness in, in, in command. And he just didn't have it at all. But for a staff officer, he seems to have lacked the idea of to grasp of, of any of his logistics or his logistical problems that he's facing him, which you would have thought, if you're a poor field commander, you would at least have a grasp of the logistics. You're absolutely right, Angus, and that's, that's what I don't get. I mean, and all of the work I've read on him was, yeah, his staff work was, was second to none. He had, he had issues in, in, in lots of his kind of competence reports. He went through the ranks about ability you know he had a, a he was said he had a lack of ability to to you know be decisive and, and make quick decisions he said but they always said and you could see that at Stalingrad but you know in terms of his of his staff work they said it's it's second to none why doesn't he bring that to bear in in any part of the campaign because from the from the from the very start when he was given his task didn't take a genius staff officer to go I'm not I'm not equipped for that you know, just looking at the at the distance um, and, so on, and what had happened you know, in the previous year, because it's not like all of a sudden, oh, don't worry, there'll be loads and loads of tarmac metal roads now and the conditions will be fantastic and we can live off the land and, and et cetera, and there'll be loads of fuel and, uh, and et cetera. He knew that, and yet he, he you know, it was a stumble. He was, he was always, it was always, and he was always kind of having to react to things that were going on and then just didn't seem to, to grasp or do the hard work that was necessary to, to even make those decisions. Um, I mean, there's been always been a big thing about it since the war that his his chief of staff, Arthur Schmidt, by the end was pretty much making any and all decisions. Powerless would just be in the background, and, and he, he was suffering from dysentery. Um, he, he developed a he earlier had he had a facial tick, um, which when under when under stress became quite pronounced. Um, and, and that really was happening. He lost a lot of weight, mainly because of his dysentery as well. So he was physically um, in a bit of a in a bit of a way. But even so, he just abrogated responsibility at, at almost every point during the campaign. I mean, so he was for me that was also the kind of key point was learning that the relationship that Paulus had with Hitler that really was, I think, the, the kind of the turning point. Because before that, Hitler, of course, had sacked quite a few generals, you know. But he'd done that, and then he, when he realised that the, the, the German army hadn't risen up and, and and pushed him out of power, that, oh, I can actually do that, because he'd always been worried. That was his always, you know, he always knew the only force strong enough to oust him and, the, uh, and his gang out of power was the German army. And so he always was wary um, of it. And then after Barbarossa, Barbarossa's failure, where he sacked a whole coterie of senior officers, and they didn't rebel against him that was that was that was a big green light for Hitler but it was his relationship with Paulus that for me was the big turning point because all of a sudden then he had a personal relationship with a guy he then promoted to, to field marshal level where that guy was would only act on Hitler's say so so before senior commanders had taken a lot of what Hitler said under advisement famously um, you know Reichenau when he took over he, he withdrew from Rostov on Don uh, so when Hitler had specifically said don't you can't do that and, and Reichenau said well I kind of can because I'm, I'm a good commander and, and of course Hitler didn't sack him it was, it was the right decision and so on but but with Paulus all of a sudden Hitler you know for him it was going back to what we said about you know inferiority complex he had about his generals all of a sudden, he's got this incredibly intelligent, educated, the epitome of the guy that he's kind of always had a chip on his shoulder about. And, and, and for Hitler, it is, it's an immense sense of power and a, and, a, and a freeing of the shackles. And from then onwards, really, the process of Hitler micromanaging the war really does start to, to, to accelerate. You know, there have been signs of it earlier, without a doubt. But from then onwards, it was, you know, I'm the man. You know, these guys are minions. You know, before I was scared about them. Now they'll just do as they're told. I've never thought of Stalingrad as rather than the loss of men. It's actually the it's the change in Hitler's attitude to the war being actually probably a, a bigger a bigger turning point that drives him into the ground. That after that, yeah, absolutely, and and it is. It, it's it's you know all of a sudden after that you've got you know uh, the, the, there's this. Um, meant to be amazing machine of the German general staff that he's just subordinated 
to one man's will um, and any any crazy decision that he he happens to make. If you don't like it, you're fired, put someone else in. If you don't like it, you're fired, put someone else in. Exactly, and they don't act together. And that's the that's the that's the thing, you know. It's it's you know their, their only hope was the German gen- the German generals at that level was then they all kind of band together and say, "Oh, we're not going to have this," and they just don't. Um, they just just cannot work together. Um, and I think that was that was Hitler's kind of realization when he when he when he realized that Powers and Mal- Manstein weren't coming together with with Vikes and Rundstedt and to t- to turn around and form a united front to say, "No, this is what we're going to do." You know, and and because it's the right decision militarily, and we're the guys that know. And he can pick Paulus off. He'd always done it politically before they seized power, divide and rule, and he did it with his own within his own party. And he realised it worked. It worked with the military as well. It worked with the generals just as it, it had done. You know, with his own with his own team. Well, that's a great point. Um, and another reason the Battle of Stalingrad could be seen as a as a turning point, not not just militarily. Thanks, John. Um, we will leave it there. Loyal listener, if you want to read John's book, I will put a link on the website. It is titled The Battle of Stalingrad Through German Eyes, The Death of the Sixth Army. If you have enjoyed this episode of the podcast, don't forget you can become a patron of the show by paying a dollar or so each month. You help me fund the show and find the time to put it all together. I do try to make extras available for patrons when I have them. So for the last episode, I made available nearly 20 minutes of Anthony Tucker-Jones and I chatting about the strategic bomber campaign against Germany, amongst other things. So if you'd like to join the gang, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. It's a big thank you to all those who support the show already. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I'm not sure what we'll be talking about in the next episode. Um, I think I might have a bonus episode to slip in before the next regular episode, but we'll see. Until then, I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. A Jerry 88mm gun hit our town, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.